Buenas tardes. Vamos a ir empezando porque se nos ha echado un poquito el tiempo encima. En primer lugar, quiero daros las gracias en nombre de la Fundación de Investigaciones Marxistas, a la que represento esta tarde aquí, a todos los que habéis colaborado con alguna ponencia, a los que habéis aportado con vuestra asistencia y vuestros debates y, por supuesto, a los que habéis quedado para escuchar esta magnífica conferencia de la profesora. El... La... Esta mujer, la doctora Nancy Holstrom, es una persona polifacética. La faceta de, de docente y de investigadora es profesora emérita y ex catedrática del Departamento de Filosofía de la Universidad Rutgers Network de Nueva York. Ha enseñado antes de esto en la Universidad de Wisconsin, en Madison, y también ha formado parte de diversos seminarios y grupos de trabajo en otras universidades. Pero además de eso, tiene una faceta que la identifica mucho más para el objetivo precisamente de esta conferencia, que es que es una activista feminista y a la vez una académica. Ella se declara de la corriente del feminismo socialista, ha sido fundadora de la Asociación de Mujeres Filósofas y de la Asociación de Filosofía Radical. Ha publicado numerosos artículos sobre temas centrales en filosofía social. Y por último, por si todo eso fuera poco, es coeditora de la revista socialista estadounidense New Politics. Aunque la investigación actual y, lo, y los intereses docentes de la doctora se encuentran en la área de la filosofía social y política, sus primeros intereses, sus primeras investigaciones se centraron, que es algo que a mí me ha impactado mucho, en la metafísica y en la filosofía de la mente. Sus primeras publicaciones fueron en estas áreas y tiene artículos maravillosos como una teoría de identidad dualista o comentarios sobre una versión de fisicalismo. Después de esto, escribe dos artículos que conectan el libre albedrío con la libertad humana en general. Títulos como Reafirmación del determinismo suave y Libre albedrío y un concepto marxista de los deseos naturales. Comenzando con estos artículos un cambio en los intereses de su investigación. Sobre estos temas básicos de filosofía social y política ha disertado de diferentes ejes. Por un lado, por supuesto, sobre la libertad, pero también ha abierto nuevas vías como la naturaleza humana de las mujeres, con un artículo que pregunta ¿las mujeres tienen una naturaleza distinta? O una teoría marxista de la naturaleza de las mujeres, entre otros. También ha escrito sobre la racionalidad, racionalidad y revolución, racionalidad, solidaridad y bienes públicos. También sobre la explotación. Hace un momento, en la entrada, le enseñaba un artículo uno de los miembros de este Congreso, así titulado simplemente Explotación. Otro también, Marx y Cohen, sobre la explotación y la teoría laboral del valor. Actualmente está trabajando en el concepto de la seguridad y su conexión con los bienes públicos. Ha editado varios libros, no se vende, en defensa de los bienes públicos, en el año 2000, el proyecto del feminismo socialista, una lectura contemporánea, en 2002, su libro más reciente, Capitalismo a favor y en contra, un debate feminista, en 2011, y últimamente, a lo largo de estos de estos dos últimos años ha participado y ha publicado mucho sobre Marx, porque el año pasado cumplimos 150 años de la edición del Capital. Este año cumplimos 200 años que vivimos con este señor, sobre nuestras espaldas y sobre nuestra inteligencia. 
Y para ello, pues os recomiendo en la web, hay artículos maravillosos de ella referidos a estos temas. Ya voy a darte paso. También ha, ha escrito sobre lo que ha significado el movimiento del 8 de marzo. Publicó el año pasado, en 2017, cuando la primera gran convocatoria y a lo largo de este año ha seguido atentamente la evolución de ese movimiento que ha culminado en nuestro país en la huelga general. Yo creo que nadie mejor para desarrollar este tema que hoy nos convoca, teoría marxista y debates feministas. Así que sin más, Nancy, muchas gracias. Apologize for being preoccupied with my phone because I had sent a copy of my paper um, so that the translator could have it, but he didn't have it. So I was looking through to find it to make sure he had it. Anyway, he has it. So the translation for those of you who uh, need it, I hope, will be uh, fine. Anyway, I first I want to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and it is really a great honor. It's a great honor particularly to be asked to speak about this topic in Spain, because I know that Spain has a very strong and very left-wing women's movement. I salute them. Uh, I wish that my Spanish were better so that I can engage more with feminists that I might meet and people involved in the movement. Um, and I also hope that my talk, which is at a pretty abstract level, might be of some interest and some use to people involved in the struggle. Okay, the title, as uh, Paula said, is Modes of Production and feminist theories. The most fundamental theoretical question for Marxist and socialist feminists is how to integrate women's oppression and capitalism. And I should just say that these words, socialist feminism and so on, are used in so many different ways. I define socialist feminism very broadly so that it includes both Marxists and non-Marxists. Anyway, but for all of us, whether we're Marxists or non-Marxists, how do you put together, understand the relationship between women's oppression and capitalism? Um, they differ as to whether the best way to understand women's position in capitalist societies is to theorize it in terms of one system, capitalism, or whether two systems are required, capitalism and also patriarchy. Patriarchy being understood as a system that existed both before capitalism and after. And oftentimes, especially in the US, a third system is um, introduced to accommodate racism. Now this debate about one system or two goes beyond the question of whether capitalism and most other modes of production are sexist. The answer is obviously yes but whether sexism or male supremacy should be understood as a system in itself comparable to capitalism. I will defend a one system analysis. Pensar con Marx on this question means to start with the, his key concept of a mode of production. More than a concept, it's the essential methodological tool for understanding history, different societies, and the potentials and limits for change within those social formations. Implicit in Marx's analysis is a moral critique of capitalism and all other class societies, and by implication, a vision of what he called a higher form of society. I'll start this talk with an explanation of the general concept of a mode of production and its centrality to many debates. And then in the second part of my talk, I'll turn to different left feminist approaches to the question of the relationship between sexism and capitalism. 
I suggest that an understanding of what constitutes a mode of production can help in approaching these feminist debates, hence the two parts of my talk. According to Marx, exploitation was essential to all class societies, indeed defining of class society, both in general and of, and of each particular form. Given that Das Kapital is devoted to an understanding of capitalism, he devoted this work to an elucidation of the form that exploitation takes in this system, namely the extraction of surplus value. Unfortunately, this had led many people to identify Marx's concept of exploitation with the particular form that it takes uh, with extraction of surplus value and thus as specific and unique to capitalism. However, this is just the particular form of exploitation in capitalism, as he makes clear in the following quote from Capital, Volume 1. Quote, the essential difference between the various economic forms of society, between, for instance, a society based on slave labor and one based on wage labor, lies only in the mode in which this surplus labor is in each case extracted from the actual producer, the laborer. Or another quote from volume three, quote, the specific economic form in which unpaid surplus labor is pumped out of direct producers determines the relations of ruler and ruled, unquote. Now notice the words which I emphasize extracted from and pumped out of. From these formulations, I infer that in Marx's view, one, a particular form of coercion and surplus extraction are connected in all class societies. In fact, they are constitutive of the relations of production that define a particular mode of production. Second, this is a fundamental explanatory feature of all class societies. Three, changes in forms of exploitation are uh, critical for understanding historical change. Exploitation occurs when producers lack control of their means of subsistence, and hence, in order to survive, they are forced, directly or indirectly, to work for others who appropriate their labor's product. In slavery or in feudalism, both the force and the extraction of surplus are clear. In capitalism, neither the force nor the surplus are apparent. Legally speaking, workers are free to work for different employers or for none, and employers pay them a wage for their labor. Marx's specific account of how, despite these appearances, workers are forced to work and the capitalist class extracts a surplus from their labor rests on the labor theory of value which is quite controversial today, even among many people calling themselves Marxists. But Marx has a broader understanding of exploitation in capitalism. Workers, Marx says, quote, agree, i.e. are compelled by social conditions, that is their lack of means of production and subsistence, to work for others who own or control these resources and who then reap the product of their labor with or without the labor theory of value, this is true. This concept of a mode of production is important for several debates, starting with what changes are and are not possible within capitalism. Probably the most important example of the capitalist limits to change is the multiple ecological crises facing the planet, which took off with the development of capitalism. Its imperative to grow is simply incompatible with a sustainable environment. Those uh, environmentalists who advocate a simpler no-growth economy, the décroissance um, movement uh, approach, which is more popular in Europe than in the US, are 100% correct. But unless they also make clear that this is impossible within capitalism, there are another variety of climate change deniers. The mode of production analysis also helps us to see that exploitation um, also existed in post-capitalist societies. 
the fundamental question is always who controls the means of production. In Soviet-style bureaucratic collectivist systems, so-called because the uh, party bureaucracy owns the means of production collectively via their control of the state, it was the bureaucracy that controlled the means of production and subsistence, leaving the producers no choice but to work for them. And it was the bureaucracy which uh, controlled the surplus for their needs and purposes. This analysis allows us to see the continuity between the modes of production of capitalism, feudalism, slave systems, and the bureaucratic system, as they are all class societies. However, the specific differences between them, these different modes of production, are equally important. Each mode of production, as Marx understood the idea, has certain kinds of structures and tendencies, a certain nature, if you will. To continue the quote given earlier, quote, it's always the direct relationship of the owners to the producers which reveals the innermost secret, the hidden basis of the entire social structure, and with it the corresponding form of the state, unquote. The mode of production theory gives Marxists the tools to understand the specifics of each form of class society, and thus how to understand societies transitioning to capitalism, whether from quote, traditional feudal modes of production, for example, India, or from so-called uh, socialist or communist modes of production, for example, China. People on the left disagree as to whether capitalism, as Marx understood it, is applicable to both these different kinds of societies. I have time just to mention two important contributions to these debates that use a mode of production analysis. Many post-colonialist thinkers have denied that Marxist analyses are applicable to countries like India because, they argue, India lacks key features of developed capitalism. Vivek Chibber, however, distinguishes those features that are essential to capitalism and those that are not. Marxism does not in contend that capitalist development will be uniform throughout the world. Rather, it claims that certain features of capitalism are universal. Universal does not entail uniform. Capitalism's economic needs, the sine qua non being profit maximization, are the defining ones, Chibber argues. They're present in India and, in fact, might be aided by the very traditional social hierarchies and oppression that post-colonialists deem to be incompatible with capitalism. They have a very idealistic view of what capitalism is. Anyway, now the systems that existed in the Soviet Union and China after their revolutions pose other questions. People calling themselves Marxists have disagreed from the very beginning as to how to characterize them. Today, these systems have changed radically. Using a mode of production analysis, Richard Smith identifies China today as a hybrid tripartite mode of production one part state-owned, another part foreign-invested private state joint venture <laughs> export sector, and the third part uh, domestic capitalist. Each of these parts has its own nature with distinct tendencies and distinct rationalities. Essentially, China has the worst of the capitalist and non-capitalist worlds, the combination of which, Smith argues, is leading to an ecological apocalypse. Though I cannot uh, elaborate further, Smith is here at this Congress, right here, speaking at the, tomorrow at the ecology section. Okay, part two. But let's turn back to gender relations and see how the mode of production analysis applies to debates in this area. In developed capitalist countries, women have become more independent from men and more equal both legally and economically than ever before. More equal, but not equal. They still are subject to sexual predation as the Me Too movement and the headlines from um, um, 
this in the United States right now have helped to highlight. Uh, women's reproductive rights are insecure and they still do the bulk of caring labor, whether for free or for low pay. Now, low paid care work is wage work. Being wage work, it fits the account of exploitation in capital, while the work they do for free does not fit this definition. There's no extraction of surplus value. Feminists have often criticized Marx on this point, and I'll turn to this criticism shortly. Despite the problems that remain for women, the extraordinary progress in gender relations within capitalism raises the question of whether women and men could ever be totally equal in a capitalist society. Liberals think so, contending it's just the remaining influences of patriarchy, or if only women tried harder, and so on. Some Marxists also seem to imply that this would, is possible by their contention that unlike class oppression, sex and race oppression are not essential to capitalism. But while they're not logically essential, that is, we can imagine a gender and race neutral version of capitalism, it doesn't follow that they're incidental. Indeed, as Marxist feminists, including myself, have argued, sexism and racism are very likely historically or pragmatically necessary. Consider what women have and have not achieved, and I'm primarily talking about developed capitalist countries here. What they've achieved are their basic democratic rights, which do not threaten profits. Indeed, that may augment them. Care work in the United States is still largely a private responsibility because supporting care as the uh, public good that it is would cut into profits. In Scandinavia and other countries with more social supports, the advent of global neoliberalism has meant drastic cutbacks in these benefits as such supports put them at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis countries without them, like the US and China. Consider also the racialization of this type of work, which is mostly care work I'm talking about, which is mostly done by immigrants and women of color. This allows its undervaluation to be obscured or rationalized as natural and appropriate for them. Thus, women's, it's a, thus capitalism's inherent nature puts constraints on gender and race equality. So if sexism seems so difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate in capitalism, how exactly should we understand their relationship? I will explain different socialist feminist positions, then offer a suggestion that I think is consistent with Marx's mode of production theory that is not reductive and gives justice to the specificities of women's oppression. What are called dual systems theories of women's oppression in capitalism were developed in the 1970s in response to the appalling sexism, uh, not just in society, but in much of the left, new left as well as old, and to quote Marxist theories which ignored or dismissed women's oppression. In the United States, Heidi Hartman referred to quote, the unhappy marriage of Marxism and feminism in which Marxism subsumed feminism, unquote. Across the ocean, similar dual systems theories were developed, most notably by Christine Delphi in France. These dual systems theorists accepted Marx's critique of capitalism, but contended that it must be supplemented and significantly revised in order to understand women's oppression. Now, Marxist and socialist feminist theories differ, vary in ways I cannot do justice to here. Some, in my opinion, provide critical enrichment of the Marxist tradition, while others not so, in my opinion. I'm focusing in this talk just on those versions of socialist feminism that posit patriarchy as a system, some call it a mode of production, 
that first is in some sense distinct from capitalism and autonomous, and secondly, that give patriarchy equivalent importance to capitalism. I will argue that this is not the most illuminating way of understanding the relationship between capitalism and sex oppression. It's easy to show that sexism and racism increase the rate of exploitation in Marx's sense, as women and racial minorities are typically confined to the lowest paid work or paid less for the same work. But dual systems theorists say this benefits male workers as well as capitalists and so should be seen as a function of patriarchy as well as capitalism. Notice that the oppression is part of the material base if you like to talk in those terms. Many feminist critics also charge that it was sexist of Marx to focus so exclusively on wage labor in capitalism and to ignore all the unpaid labor done by women in the home Again, very material. Indeed, they find it particularly insulting that according to Marx's analysis, this labor is not productive labor. Surely, they contend, much of this labor is absolutely necessary for the reproduction of the workforce, both biologically and in a sense of getting the worker to the factory door every year of day. Hence, not only necessary for life in general, but for capitalism. Other feminist critics, like Christine Delphi, don't like this focus on domestic labor and capitalism. Instead, they theorize a domestic mode of production alongside of capitalism in which men exploit women's labor. So rather than describing patriarchy and capitalism with um, the more vague term system, Delphi theorizes them both in the Marxist terminology of two modes of production. In patriarchy, one class, men, exploits another class, women. I'll address these two points in turn. It was not sexism nor an oversight, I contend, that led Marx to exclude household labor from his category of productive in capitalism. Of course, it is productive in a general sense. Production of people is obviously essential in all times and places. But Marx restricts the definition of productive labor as he does in order, quote, to express precisely the specific form of labor on which the whole mode of the capitalist mode of production and capitalism itself is based, unquote. As Rosa Luxemburg said, from the standpoint of capital, quote, the dancer in a cafe who makes a profit for her employer with her legs is a productive working woman, while all the toil of the women and mothers of the proletariat within the four walls of the home is considered unproductive work. This sounds crude and crazy, but is an active, accurate expression of the crudeness and craziness of today's economic order." Unquote. Note that the labor of a carpenter in the public sector is equally unproductive in this sense because his labor, assuming it's a he, does not produce surplus value. Thus, there's no insult in the designation of a particular form of labor as unproductive. It's simply that the question of what is and is not productive in our system must be answered within the context or framework of the crude and crazy system of capitalism." Unquote. Though domestic labor does not produce surplus value, capitalism and the constraints it poses are still important for understanding its persistence. The more labor done in the home for free, the less capitalists have to pay for labor. This helps to explain why women in the United States were able to win legal equality, democratic rights, incredibly important gains, but why caretaking is still largely a private responsibility done primarily by women. The legal gains won by the women's movement did not threaten capitalist profits, but the women's movement did not succeed in winning the extensive and expensive 
social services that would be necessary for full equality, child care, elder care, medical care, housing, equal pay for equal right, work, unquote. This was especially difficult to achieve because the women's movement came along when capitalism was entering a downturn. Capitalism thus puts constraints on the extent to which sexism can be overcome. So again, the framework of capitalism is critical to understanding what the women's movement could and could not achieve, and critical to understanding why, in the age of neoliberal globalization, these gains are under attack in the countries where that had achieved them. However, feminists rightly insist that men also benefit from women's unpaid labor in the home, even if one argues that in the long run, most men do not benefit from this gender system because it helps per, uh, perpetuate capitalism. They, men certainly benefit in the short run. They have a shorter work day. And even though domestic labor does not produce surplus value, this doesn't mean that women are only oppressed in the home but not exploited, as some Marxists have argued. As Delphi correctly points out, ex uh, exploitation is a broader concept than extraction of surplus value. Remember, as I quoted before, Marx said this is simply the form that exploitation takes in capitalism. The unpaid surplus labor that women have no choice but to do in the home fits the Marxist definition of exploited labor, though not its distinctly capitalist form. Now, whether it's husbands or men in general, or both capitalists and men who exploit domestic labor, is much too complicated to resolve here. But I'm inclined to say there is no one answer to this question. It depends, rather, on the details of the family. In particular, whether there's a man present at all, the number of children, just how much domestic work a woman does compared to a man, the man if he is present, and whether or not this is in addition to wage work, which most women in developed capitalist countries are doing. So I think that a theory of dom um, a domestic mode of production alongside a capitalist mode of production is less plausible today if it ever was. However, Marxists do not claim that capitalist class relations are the only important social relations or indeed the only class relations that exist in capitalism. In fact, other modes of production, for example, slavery, have often coexisted with, within capitalism, and hierarchies based on race, ethnicity, and nationality have thrived within capitalist societies. So even if the idea of a patriarchal mode of production with, with men and women forming two classes is not, as I've argued, the best way of illuminating sexism and capitalism, it's not inherently inconsistent with Marxism. On the other hand, what would require a significant revision of Marxism is the claim that the two systems are of equal explanatory weight for understanding our current system, its history, and its trajectory. While this can be explored through ongoing research, which could end up enriching Marxism, the idea raises a number of thorny medical, methodological issues which make me skeptical. One, if it's necessary to posit a distinct system of equal importance to understand how sexism works within capitalism, then why only two systems? Racism is a kind of oppression in which most members of one group benefit at the expense of another. As women of color have stressed, women, even of the same class, are not a homogeneous group. Some dual systems theorists acknowledge this and have developed triple systems and models. While racism is the most obvious candidate for, the, for a third system, one often hears talk of classism, racism, sexism, and heterosexism, ageism, ableism. These are all relations of power and unjust privilege. But does it make sense to theorize them as systems? This leads to the question, what exactly, two, what exactly constitutes a system? 
While I do not have a dis definitive answer, capitalism is clearly a system. Its constitutive elements give it powerful tendencies that began in the transition from feudalism to capitalism in England centuries ago with the separation of producers from their means of production and the amassing of wealth by others. Now we see the same process called primitive accumulation in Russia and China as they've moved from the Soviet system to capitalism. Descriptions of, ca of factory conditions throughout the developing world today could be taken directly from Engels' descriptions in the condition of the working class in England in the 19th century. The drive to turn everything into a commodity has gen penetrated areas of the globe, the globe, our bodies and our minds, in ways few could have imagined. Most significantly, capitalism's need to develop the productive forces to grow, to accumulate on an ever-expanding basis is so powerful that it has melted the ice caps and now threatens the very basis of life on human life on this planet. Now that's a system. I don't see sexism as having anything like this kind of explanatory weight. What we see are descriptions of multifarious ways in which sexism operates in capitalism and other modes of production, though not all. How it has changed, lessened in many ways within capitalism, but still persists. While it has some autonomous causal efficacy, struggles against it have succeeded only within the terms set by capitalism, as I've already discussed. For understanding capitalism, it is essential to see how deeply sexist and racist it is. But this does not entail that sexism or racism constitute a system in anything like the sense in which capitalism is a system. The attempts with which I am familiar to demonstrate patriarchy's explanatory power have not been convincing. In particular, Hartman's argument that the family wage was a product of patriarchy and capitalism. Three, these are the thorny methodological questions that arise from the idea of the two systems. Three, if we did take capitalism and patriarchy as distinct systems involving two sets of classes, men and women in the patriarchal mode, and capitalists and workers in capitalism, and yet more to deal with racism, how these classes interrelate is complicated. After all, some women exploit other women and also exploit men, both in capitalist terms and in familial terms. And as I, I think I indicated, the class divide among women is increasing. How do the classes formed by capitalism and patriarchy and racism interrelate. It's clearer analytically, I think, to see sex hierarchies as existing within socioeconomic classes rather than being distinct kinds of classes. That is, rich men tend to be richer than rich women, but rich women are still much better off than poor men. In fact, gender inequalities today are significantly less than class inequalities, as two recent sex dis um, discrimination lawsuits in the United States reveal. A bond salesman at Morgan Stanley sued because, of her, because her salary of over a million dollars a year was much lower than her male colleagues doing the same work. But they were all rich, even if men are richer. In another case, women at Walmart sued because their annual salary was $1,100 lower than the men. But the average pay for all Walmart employees is only $10 an hour. So they're all poor, even if the women are poorer. The popular term, a concept of intersectionality, uh, and when I wrote this, I had a parenthesis. I'm not sure if this term is as widely used in Europe as it is in the US, but I saw in the hall that feminism must be intersectional. Okay, so this popular idea might seem to answer the question of the relationship between cap capitalism and sex or race oppression. 
In political practice, it is very important to emphasize the intersection of different kinds of oppression, or else we, we risk the false counterposition of class politics and what are dismissively labeled in the US as identity politics. As already discussed, class is always gendered and raced. Working class women's lives and oppression do not begin at the door to the factory or office. The same is true of non-white working class men. Since socialists want to organize working class women and men of different races and ethnicities, they have to recognize this and take it into account in their organizing, and they increasingly do. Intersectionality is thus a very important concept, and it's correct as far as it goes. However, intersectionality does not explain on a theoretical level exactly how and why different kinds of oppression relate as they do. Moreover, the notion of intersectionality does not commit us to two or more systems or modes of production, as we could just as well be exploring the intersection of different aspects of one mode of production, one system of capitalism, and which is the way I think of it. In fact, talk of a distinct system of patriarchy tends to obscure the integration of sexism with capitalism and to encourage people treating them as distinct autonomous systems. Thus, for example, um, a philosopher named Anne Cudd, my co-author of the book Capitalism For and Against, A Feminist Debate, blames patriarchy for women's lower pay and the absence of childcare and never even mentions capitalism, although it's quite obvious that capitalism, capitalists benefit from the lack of childcare and women having lower salaries. My concern is that if we proliferate, proliferate systems of equivalent importance, we lose explanatory coherence and end up with simple pluralism. Nevertheless, I must contend, concede that dual or triple system models are more attractive to many people than a unitary model. And I think this is so for several reasons. As discussed, there's the political importance of the intersectional model, the fear based on all too many historical examples that sex and race oppression will be subsumed by class. And second, the fact that sex oppression and race oppression seem distinct and are often experienced as distinct from class oppression. For these reasons, theorists have continued to work to develop intersectional theories which seem, although not necessarily, to support dual and triple systems analyses. A recent sophisticated version is that offered by French theorist Danielle Cargo who wants to capture what she calls the interplay, the dynamic social and historical character of gender, race, and class, rather than seeing them as abstract and distinct elements that are added together. To do so, she borrows the word term consubstantiality from theological debates regarding the unity and difference of the three elements of the Trinity. Gender, race, and class are each held to be a relation of production involving exploitation. Thus, there is no difference of substance between the three. Problematic assumptions, maybe, but I'll ignore this. By co-forming and equally and mutually determining one another, they constitute a mutual, a unified system of three systems of equivalent importance. The theory of consubstantiality is an intriguing attempt to understand differences within a unity, which makes it a definite improvement over additive models. However, the unity is not a coherent one because given the equal importance of the three, their unity cannot provide an explanation of how, when, and why the elements interact as they do. The relation is ultimately mysterious, like the Trinity, as Cinzia Arutza wittily puts the point. Okay, four. If we conclude then 
that the best model is one system, not two or three or four. The final methodological question is how to characterize that system and understand its dynamics. Some would simply call the system capitalist, patriarchal, racist, heterosexist, dot, 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 which is accurate descriptively, but leaves us with the same old problem of how and why they all work together and how this is different from simple pluralism. What I think we need, and this is my pro positive proposal nearing the end, is a model that gives primer, primacy of explanation to capitalism, but which is not reductive. There are different ways of doing this. You may recall Engels' letters on historical materialism in which he corrected misinterpretations of historical materialism by saying that all he and Marx ever said was that the economic was ultimately decisive or in the long run, etc. Such phrases provide important clarification but don't get us very far. Better, I think, is what US philosopher Milton Fisk calls the framework model based on Marx, which has been implicit in my talk. Explanation is contextualist rather than atomist. The idea is that different modes of production, like capitalism and feudalism, have structures which make possible different causal relations. Capitalism is thus then understood to be the context or framework within which other relations of, of oppression operate. These relations of oppression have more or less salience in different times and places. So this account gives capitalism a primacy in explanation of what happens within it, but it does not rule out other causes. On the contrary, it helps to explain how and why other causes operate both material and non-material causes. Thus, while capitalism did not create male dominance, it uses it. Capitalism's essential nature allowed for male dominance to lessen in some ways, but sets obstacles to its complete eradication. Though one can imagine capitalism without sexism or racism, thus it's logically independent, it's difficult to see how this could come about in the real world. Thus, uh, this, these kinds of oppression seem to be pragmatically, historically necessary to capitalism, though not logically necessary. What I've attempted to do in this talk is to show that women's oppression in all its many aspects can be understood as existing within one mode of production, capitalism, but without reducing women's oppression to capitalism. Last paragraph. Finally, in conclusion, I suggest that the mode of production analysis also gives us the key conditions for socialism, a higher form of society. As Marx conceived it, this is a society where the means of production are under collective democratic control. So the conditions for exploitation and alienation do not exist. Both these points are expressed in the famous quote from Capital, Volume 3, quote, the producers rationally regulate their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control with the least expenditure of energy and under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature, unquote. Beyond that, he says, is the true realm of freedom, concluding, the shortening of the workday is its basic prerequisite. Such a society would allow for more time with our families and friends and for all kinds of labor that are not profitable within capitalism, be it caring labor to enhance the health and welfare of human beings and of the earth, artistic and other kinds of creative work, and more time simply for leisure. Socialism is thus inherently feminist and eco-socialist. But it should be clear that Marx's vision of collective rational regulation of production is only possible on a global level, as the level of production has to be f sufficient for everyone in the world to have a decent standard of living. Thank you.
Bien, tenemos 15 minutos todavía para la hora oficial de finalización y Nancy me había, me había planteado antes que tenía interés en contestar preguntas del público y, y dialogar con vosotros. Así que, sin más, abrimos el turno. ¿Se puede con micro? Sí, es porque él va a hablar en inglés y si no... Ya, si no, los demás no, no van a poder traducir. Ya, ya, right, right. Sí. Perfecto. Me gustaría que empezara presentando, uh, presentándose. Ah, uh, Professor Kasi, I'm from Senegal. I congratulations. I really appreciate what you are uh, saying in your paper. And I have a question. Uh, sometimes I wonder, I wonder why. I, I don't, I don't understand how can uh, those those who are fighting against racism and sexism, and uh, for, the, for feminism and more equal humanity, uh, ignore the analysis of Marx of the dominant uh, modes of production. Of the dominant what? Mod, mod of production, modes in, in plural, uh, from the beginning to now. Because from the beginning we know uh, uh, all about uh, uh, the, mode of, the dominant mode of production. You talk about the, the Indian mode of production that was very discussed uh, among us uh, during the, six, the 70s in, in France uh, to see how uh, the capitalism is setting uh, in Africa, for example. You know, uh, how can they ignore the analysis, like I say, of the dominant modes of production all over the world, especially from the beginning of slavery over colonialism and post-colonial uh, uh, time, especially for those African countries from north to the south. Uh, I, I think that uh, it is the same, uh, uh, the same way to understand, uh, the same way to understand maybe uh, the system of the capitalism and how strong the system is to make confusion into the into the, the ideas of those who are fighting against racism and sexism and for some kind of feminism. Because if I uh, uh, see how our women in Africa are fighting against exploitation in the gender form, it is very, very, very different from the way uh, people are fighting for feminism in other parts of the world. Thank you. I apologize for my English. <laughs> I'm more comfortable in French. <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, it's a complicated question, and I don't think I can say, you know, anything very adequate. Um, in the United States, of all the women who are involved, who would call themselves feminists, most of them are liberals. They're barely aware of what capitalism is. I mean, the United States is different from Europe. <laughs> And Africa in that socialism and Marxism, you know, have a very small um, influence um, and um, just never occurs to them. So if they're experiencing sexism or if um, a, a man or woman is experiencing racism, they just do not have that, that category of thinking. I mean, the most radical and the most political do But unfortunately, you can be radical, like a radical feminist or a black nationalist, and it doesn't connect to, to um, an economic understanding. You know, it's a very small percentage of uh, women in the United States, or I expect in Europe, more in Europe, but in the United States, 
who have a really un, a big understanding of capitalism, of imperialism, you know, and um, are internationalists. Some, but it's a very small percentage. If you think about uh, the Women's March, which I'm sure you all heard about after Trump was elected, it was huge, huge. Um, the number of women, the percentage um, who were socialists or Marxists, you know, like a really small percentage. Okay, so, I mean, in, in Spain, uh, <laughs> the women's movement is much more radical, and in Europe in general. Um, and it differs from country to country. The, the black movement in the United States, there are different parts of it. I mean, you know, many of them just really want to get their peace, <laughs> you know, in politics, uh, locally or nationally, and are not especially radical. Others are, but the Black Lives Matter movement, which is very, very important, um, the number, you know, the percentage of them who have an anti-capitalist perspective, I mean, some, but by no means in the United States, they just don't see it. You know, they want, you know, women want to be able to ha have, to advance and get their democratic rights. Blacks want to do the same thing in the United States. You know, perfectly understandable, justifiable, et cetera, but it doesn't really go further than that among the majority, sadly. <laughs> That's our job. <laughs> what? Uh, I, I apologize for my English. Uh, I only want to, to ask you... Uh, A little louder, please. Yes. Well, uh, I only ask you, what's your opinion on uh, Iris Marion's own approach? Because I think, uh, see, uh, Iris Marion Jones talk uh, about this, about the differences between uh, gender, sex, and race. What's your opinion? Is, uh, You're talking about Iris Marion Young. Iris okay. Marion. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I can answer that either. I knew her um, before she became so famous, and uh, she was a socialist. Um, then she got more into democratic theory and difference, and doesn't doesn't come back to capitalism very much. I don't know that it's you know her work is inconsistent with it, but um, I stopped following it so much to be honest. So maybe you could tell me how you think it connects. <laughs> Sí. Say it again. I, I think that at earlier on, there was a, when dual systems theories came out, um, there was a book called Women in Revolution. It was a collection of different um, feminist writings. And Iris, at that time, uh, preferred one system. Um, so, you know, she might find it, you know, quite compatible with this. You know, versus, say, Nancy Fraser's um, um, more uh, dividing different struggles of, of, uh, for sex equality and race equality. And it, um, I think Iris had a more unified approach. But the, the debate that um, she had with Nancy Fraser, I just found not very productive. I mean, I didn't see what the big difference was. Each wanted to put it in terms of their theory, you know, and I don't know, I gave up. ¿Alguien más se anima? Menos mal que ha pedido la palabra una mujer. A young woman. 
Hello. Hello. <laughs> First of all, it was a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. And I would like to ask you, what is your opinion about the, the people who think that it's not compatible to fight against the racism and uh, sexism? At the same time, you fight with the capitalism because there is a lot of people in the left that think that they think that they think that a device of the, all the people and at the end. Are you talking about um, men on the left? Are you talking about feminists or both who don't see? At the, both, both of them because a lot of people at the end try to um, ignore all their op operations and they only think in the economic terms because they think that is not compatible. Yeah, well, I think uh, that here the notion of intersectionality is very, very important. You know, to point out that, okay, um, uh, you, uh, men and women working in the similar type of job, um, you know, may, uh, both need to struggle for um, economic rights and for better, um, um, better pay and and so on, and for better unions, especially in the United States, they're highly bureaucratic. Okay, so those are common interests, but if you don't also take into account that women's sexual harassment on the job, maybe racism on the job, if you don't take that into account, by and large, those women will be less interested. You know, the, the, the uh, socialists, the labor activists, if they don't, un they don't bring in these other forms of oppression, they're going to lose, you know, in their struggle against capitalism. You need to get people more involved in all kinds of ways. And um, if, um, if the um, uh, women um, are struggling on a, not an economic issue, but issues of sexual harassment, as is going on in the United States right now. There was a, a march just the other day against the um, nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, I'm sure you know. So that's, that doesn't have anything to do with economics right away. But it's something profoundly important to women throughout the country, throughout the world. Um, at all different class levels, in all different ethnicities. So uh, women have a right to turn you know, should have a right to turn to their co-workers and say, look, you support me on this, you know, or if you don't support me on this, you know, I'm not supporting you, you know. It, it, you know, you have to have solidarity. Um, and um, I think that's the best way to build broad, common, collective struggles is to engage in solidaristic kinds of activities. You know, so when, um, um, American citizens of all ethnicities and genders um, turned out against Trump's attacks on immigrants. That was very, very important. And I think, you know, when we do things like that, then we can turn to the groups that we've been provided support for to ask for the same. You know, I think, you know, people are what can I say, they don't necessarily see, but it's through that type of argument and those type of struggles that I hope we can bridge the gap. Does that address your question at all? Not that it's easy to do. <laughs> yes, it's not easy, but yes, I'm sure. I hope to that, that finish in a future, and thank you so much. You're welcome. Bien, son las ocho y media en punto. Si alguien tiene muchísima gana de hablar, tiene muchísima. Venga, vamos a dejar que te vaya tú con esta pena. Yo solo una pregunta eh, conceptual. El, perdón, la hago en castellano porque en inglés no me defiendo bien. Eh, si nos podrías explicar, si es posible eh, brevemente, en qué consiste, porque no he entendido bien la diferencia entre un modo de producción y los diversos modos de opresión. 
Si he entendido bien, está el modo de producción capitalista que incluye diferentes modos de opresión, como es el de sexo y el de raza. Y si he entendido bien, todos ellos implican explotación. Entonces, ¿cuál es la diferencia entre modo de producción y modo de opresión? Gracias. Well, I tried to say that a mode of production um, is a political economic system based on exploitation, which has a certain logic, a certain nature, which gives it certain tendencies. And the particular form of exploitation um, is key to understanding how it works, how it changes, the limits, etc. So that's a mode of production. Now, there are different kinds of um, oppressions, maybe national, um, gender, race, that operate within various modes of production. Sometimes they're, uh, they don't necessarily have exploitation as the key, as the essence. Some of it is, um, I don't know, more ideological. Usually there's some material aspect. Um, but some modes of production or some uh, some periods of time and places of capitalism, say, um, like I think I, I think it's undoubtedly the case, undeniable, that gender oppression within has lessened within capitalism. Okay, I think the same is true for race oppression. They still exist. It's still important, but there are certain developments. You know, it's more key at certain times than at other times. So the nature of the mode of production, capitalism, is the context or framework in which you can under, try to understand how and why sexism has lessened, racism has lessened, or, you know, when in times like now, when where capitalism is more shaky and not delivering the goods to so many people, that it's easy to appeal to racism, anti-immigrant feeling, you know? So you can understand the rise and fall and changes within kinds of oppression by the nature of the mode of production. Does that help at all? Okay, good. But these are extremely complicated, empirical, uh, analytic questions. You know, to see what exactly is happening, what can explain it. You know, so I'm giving a, um, a methodological tool for trying to approach these real life historical sociological questions. Bien, pues muchísimas gracias por vuestra presencia. Yo creo que hoy, este año, estamos celebrando los 200 años de la existencia de Carlos Marx y para las mujeres que somos del feminismo socialista, como ella dice, marxistas, feministas, eh, era muy importante que esa convocatoria del 8 de marzo se declarase anticapitalista como se declaró. Y así se convocó. Y, y a mí me llenó de emoción, yo que soy una feminista vieja de la segunda ola, ver a esas chicas jóvenes gritando por la calle, patriarcado y capital, alianza criminal. A mí se me caían las lágrimas. Y yo creo que es el mejor regalo que podemos hacer a Marx en su 200 aniversario. Muchas gracias por haber venido y por estar tan atentas. And thank you for your good questions, all very good questions.